Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Matthew Weissman. Thanks for joining us today. And we're thrilled to have with us our special guest, Dr. Vani George, who's an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Disease here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Of course. You know, we were talking about hepatitis today, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, that's brought on by some of the changes, as you know, in the screening mm -hmm. guidelines. So there's hepatitis C guidelines that have been expanded over the years, including a 2014 law in New York City to screen most people now for uh, for hepatitis C. And then recently, the CDC put out guidelines to screen people for hepatitis B as well. So. You know, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about, you know, why people are doing that and why that's so important. Yeah, of course. So with hepatitis, um, yeah, the, as you mentioned there, the CDC did put out new guidelines two months ago. I believe it was April. So basically now we um, screen every individual over the age of 18, uh, regardless of risk factors. In the past, we used to screen based on risk factors but we did find that there were still certain infections that were um, not catching until they turn later, mm. you know, until it becomes a chronic hepatitis. So um, really the goal of, uh, you know, the best thing to do is prevention. Prevention is key for any hepatitis, any viral hepatitis. So we'd like to um, screen more people out there. So now the screening guidelines uh, state that every patient over the age of 18 um, should be screened for um, hepatitis B. Uh, with three uh, types of serological markers and um, and also all pregnant females, uh, regardless of whether you were screened in the past, um, all all pregnancies, all women um, should be uh, screened with hepatitis B. Got it. I so guess. a lot of you know a lot of times people are asymptomatic; they have no symptoms during these episodes. Right. Um, is that the? I mean, are most people with hepatitis symptom free? Well, that, yeah, that depends. So hepatitis A, um, it's, that's the foodborne illness. Um, so that's the illness where, uh, you know, the transmission is mainly through fecal oral contact. So you'll get it through, um, you know, from close contact, or sometimes you'll see over the news that you'll have uh, certain outbreaks. Uh, so 70% of people that do get hepatitis A do have symptoms, and these mm. symptoms are pretty nonspecific. It's uh, it's fevers, myalgia, sometimes oh, right. muscle, so muscle pain, aches, sorry, yeah, diarrhea, muscle aches, diarrhea um, joint pain. Uh, sometimes they can have jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin, mm. yellowing of the eyes. Um, so a lot of times it's it's kind of like flu-like symptoms um, that they can be experiencing, and 70% of the people, they can have symptoms, and 30% don't. Um, but hepatitis B and C, um, it really varies. It depends on uh, when people were infected. Um, if, if it's a child less than the age of five, they tend to be asymptomatic, but the adults tend to be, uh, tend to feel the symptoms about 50% of the time. So um, it really varies for hepatitis B and C, but there are a good amount of uh, individuals that we do see in, in clinical practice where they don't have any symptoms. But, you know, based on serologic markers, we can tell if they had recent infection. Yeah. So I feel like that's what comes up a lot, you know, especially now that we're screening so many people for hepatitis mm -hmm. B and C. Um, and a lot of times, I guess they probably had an asymptomatic infection that they cleared. Right. Because a lot of times we're seeing people with, you know, their sort of long term antibodies positive, but their short term antibodies negative. Maybe right. can you just take us through like for each of those what? You know, one of the challenges is that people often see their lab results even mm -hmm. before I see them because they get released online. Right. And I don't want people to get nervous when they see yeah. that their, you know, hepatitis B surface antibody is positive. So maybe we should just yeah. talk through a couple of those. Of course. Yeah, we can definitely talk about it. And this actually happens a lot to me as well as people do see the, the antibody. So um, for hepatitis A, it's very simple. There's only one antibody, which is the hepatitis A IgG antibody that we do uh, screen. Mm -hmm. um, so this particular antibody will either be positive if you were previously vaccinated or if you were if you had a previous exposure and you um, were treated. So self-resolved, in other words. So um, you can differentiate between uh, you know a vaccination versus. Uh, previous infection based on the hepatitis A IgG serology alone. Um, but when you see it, that means you're immune and there's nothing to worry about. Right. So that's 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 a good thing to see. And now all the babies are getting vaccinated or most babies yes. are getting vaccinated with hepatitis A vaccine yes. early on. So right. we'll see, hopefully we'll see, we'll see more, more and more of that IgG, people being protected. Right. Yeah. 
So with hepatitis B, um, that's a little bit more complicated because there's three things that we specifically test for. We test for something called the surface antigen. So that's on the outer aspect of the virus. Um, and then we also test for the surface antibody. So um, if you see surface antibody alone, that means you've been previously vaccinated because the vaccine is uh, composed of just the surface uh, antigen. Mm. And then if you see, and then we also test for something called core antibody. So if you see core antibody, that means you previously were exposed. Um, and then really the next step to do is take a look at the surface antibody because that will tell us uh, whether you were immune to uh, hepatitis B or not. So if the surface antibody is negative and the core antibody is positive, then um, you basically have to see a specialist and figure out where in the hepatitis B chronological stages you might be. Um, so that's that's really the next step. And then in, with respect to the third um, hepatitis virus, the hepatitis C, um, that's also a pretty straightforward. You, we test for the antibody, and if that's positive, then we look for the virus itself, and then um, you'll see a specialist based on what the numbers are. Got it. So hepatitis B surface antibody positive alone, not to worry. Yeah. Hepatitis C antibody positive. I guess it depends on depends whether the, on RNA the RNA is positive, mm -hmm. but oftentimes you don't have to worry because those could be signs that you cleared it cleared. long ago. Right. Um, now, are there particular groups who are more, we talked a little bit about fecal oral spread mm -hmm. for, hepatitis for hepatitis A. And so I guess that happens more maybe in travelers or in restaurants spread or something like that. Yeah. So specifically for hepatitis A, um, the people at risk are um, international travelers. Anytime you're about to go for um, any international travel, you should really see um, a travel specialist or an infectious diseases doctor to see if you should be getting the hepatitis A vaccine or any other vaccine really. Um, and outside of that, certain populations, the homeless population, unfortunately, mm. uh, persons who are um, dealing with homelessness, they tend to have higher rates of hepatitis A. Um, and, uh, you know, certain uh, patients with multiple sexual partners would also have um, higher rates of hepatitis A. With respect to hepatitis B, um, worldwide, we actually see, see a lot of perinatally acquired hepatitis mm. B. Um, in the United States, not so much. In the United States, we see a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, transmission through sex or sometimes through needle stick injuries. Um, it's a lot more contagious than HIV. Um, so in that sense, um, sometimes we, uh, you know, we always screen anyone who's um, on hemodialysis for hepatitis B. Um, and anyone living in uh, congregate settings, um, we screen for hepatitis A and B. Um, so those are some of the risk factors. For hepatitis B for, or C. Yeah, hepatitis B or C. And what about sort of like household contacts to people who are like sharing razors or toothbrushes yeah. and stuff or kissing? I mean, do, do those things, they have to worry about that stuff? Yeah, so if anyone in your family has um, that hepatitis B surface antigen, the CDC guidelines tell you, you know, don't share needles, don't share toothbrushes, don't share razors. Um, and you should really be careful. And if there's any open wounds, you cover it, um, you know, put a Band-Aid on it. And if there's any spillage of blood, um, be careful and clean it up with bleach. Um, uh, you know, after wearing gloves, of course, because uh, it, 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 they can be transmitted. That is a way of transmitting. So um, it's best to, um, it's best to like uh, maintain those precautions. Right, to keep the blood separate, got mm -hmm. it. Um, so are there other things that people can do to protect themselves? Yeah, of course. Um, so there's vaccinations available for hepatitis A and B. Um, there's no vaccine available for hep C yet, but hopefully that will come in the future. But um, for hepatitis A and B, we recommend um, pretty much all international travelers for hepatitis A should be vaccinated. And um, there are certain high risk groups. Um, and if you see your doctor, they'll, they'll, they can go through um, the list of um, you know possible indications. And if you want to get vaccinated, um, you, you should definitely get vaccinated for hepatitis A. And for hepatitis B, um, vaccination is actually recommended for all individuals uh, less than the age of 60. Over the age of 60, it's uh, based on risk factors. But again, um, it's pretty, uh, it, you know, we would definitely recommend it because there are um, a lot of possibilities. So if you're ever, as I mentioned, if you're ever going to go to a nursing home or 
Um, mm. If you're going to be part of, if you're going to be on dialysis, um, you know, there are certain risk factors that would uh, predispose you and we would, we would like to vaccinate everyone. Is there a downside to getting vaccinated if you're over 60? Not really. Absolutely not. Um, there's, uh, I guess like when, you know, when the recommendations come out, they take a look uh, in terms of um, cost effective analysis, mm. but generally speaking, it's better to get vaccinated. Yeah. And if people can't remember if they got vaccinated with hepatitis A or B as a kid, do you recommend testing them first or just going ahead and vaccinating them? So there's no harm in revaccinating. Um, so sometimes I, I think uh, per, pref, uh, personally, I like to test the antibodies and if they're negative, then I revaccinate. Um, because the other thing is sometimes people do get vaccinated as a child, but they don't build a good immune response. Mm. So that way, at least I take a look and I, if I see that there's a good immune response, then um, I revaccinate them. However, if, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if you do remember, or if, even if you don't remember, there's no, there's no harm in revaccinating. Um, some, one patient I had, yeah, they basically didn't, they had antibodies, but then they wanted to get the vaccine again because they were going on a trip. So um, it's not, there's no harm in revaccinating. Got it. And I know I get asked this all the time, if they started the series, <laughs> either series and they didn't finish, they can just keep going, right? You can, yeah, they can just keep going, right, yeah. All right, so we talked a little bit about vaccine for prevention. We talked about some lifestyle preventions. I think that's, you know, not sharing toothbrushes, right. not sharing intravenous needles. Mm -hmm. Anything else that I... Uh, that uh, I appropriate sanitation. If you're traveling elsewhere, uh, make sure you're, you know, drinking um, boil, uh, uh, bottled water. So um, wash your hands, right? right. Appropriate sanitation and uh, hand hygiene. Perfect. All right, so before we wrap up, can we just talk about treatment for a little bit? Because there is actually some advances over the last couple of years yeah, in, in treatment. Of course, so um, hepatitis A is supportive. Um, right. It's, so it's self-resolved, self-limited, meaning um, it usually like 98% of the patients get better by six months. So there's really no treatment indicated for hepatitis A. I'm gonna jump over hep B and go to hep C because that we have some great advancements. Yeah. Um, hep C is now uh, curable, so we can, you know, for all, most of the genotypes, we can take a look at the genotype and we can um, start treatment for it. Um, and we look at certain, um, you know, parameters um, clinically, and then we can do the treatment. So that's curable. Hepatitis and that's curable now with pills, right? Because yeah, it with used pills. to be like injections, but yeah, now so no tell, interferon. Tell me a little bit about some of the, I mean, how long do people have to take regimens for? So usually how unpleasant is it? It's actually, um, I mean, I've, I have a couple patients and they don't really describe much unpleasantness, but it's usually eight to 12 weeks. And it, the treatment duration really depends on certain um, aspects of, uh, you know, right. which they kind have of hepatitis C, yeah, what kind of hepatitis right. C, what genotype, um, do they have uh, fibrosis, do they have cirrhosis? Um, so those sort of underlying uh, aspects we take a look at, and we also uh, closely follow these patients with uh, liver medicine if they're a little, if, you, if they have any evidence of cirrhosis. Um, so Hep C can be treated. Um, most of it's pretty well tolerated. The medications, um, the side effects, it can, it can, uh, it, they are, they can go through the liver. So they um, sometimes they can have side effects from that standpoint, but usually. Um, we see the RNA levels go down right away, and they're pretty remarkable in that sense. Um, hepatitis B, unfortunately, um, you know, there, there are certain medications out there, and the really goal of the medications is to bring the viral DNA down, um, but they don't really um, cause, they don't really result in a cure just yet. So mm. we, we try to like suppress the DNA, so there's no significant fibrosis and inflammation to the, um, you know, to the liver, but Overall, um, we sort of monitor for hepatitis B. Right, so monitor some, monitor some medicines. Some and... can, yeah, some patients get um, medicines based on you know their DNA, their, how the inflammation is in the liver, but generally speaking, uh, we monitor, yeah. Got it. So you talked a little bit about cirrhosis and fibrosis and sort of the scar tissue that forms from chronic infections. So, so take me back through that a little bit. For hepatitis A, people generally do really, really well. Yeah, hepatitis A, um, unless there's other infections, people generally do really well. As I mentioned, 99%, they just self-resolve. Um, hepatitis B and C, um, it's a little bit more complicated. For hepatitis B, about 25% of patients with chronic hepatitis B, meaning they didn't self-resolve, and they go into the state of chronic infection. 
um, they can develop cirrhosis over their lifetime. Um, so that's why these patients, it's really critical that we monitor them uh, with blood work. We take a look at their, you know, how much virus is in their body, um, how their liver is doing. And hepatitis C, the numbers around the same, about 30% of patients without, that were not treat, uh, treated for hepatitis C, um, we call it chronic hepatitis C, they, they can go into, they, they can develop cirrhosis and later on like uh, end stage liver disease. Yeah, right, liver cancer, I mean, they're at risk, yeah, for, there's liver a risk cancer, for liver cancer. And then potentially transplant right. or something down the road. Yeah, so the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is uh, liver cancer, um, it's high with hepatitis B and C. Not uh, rarely we see it with hepatitis A. Got it. Yeah. All right. So I think we've I think we've done it. I mean, I you know, <laughs> important to get screened because of all the asymptomatic infections. Important to get vaccinated if you're not already to prevent the ones we can prevent, uh, and important to get treatment for the treatable ones to make sure that we're keeping an eye on it to reduce the risk or or identify early cirrhosis, scarring, cancer, and make sure, you know, we're reducing people's risks for liver transplant down the road. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dr. George, Thank so, you so much, much for joining us. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.